Well, hello again, everybody. Um, please continue to enjoy your lunch, but in the interest of time, we'll get the program going this morning, or this afternoon, rather. My name is Tim Sink. I'm president of the Greater Concord Chamber of Commerce, and thank you all for being here on this beautiful, snowy day. A couple of quick announcements before we get the program rolling. We've got some upcoming events that uh, I wanted to bring to your attention. On January 18th, uh, the Concord Young Professional Network will be holding its monthly uh, networking event. This is at the Bank of New Hampshire stage at 5.30 p.m. Also, if you would like to get reconnected with the Chamber or learn more about our programs and, and benefits, um, you're more than welcome to join us at uh, an event we call Meet Your Chamber. It is a luncheon at the Chamber. This will take place on January 25th at noon and um, just let us know if you would like to attend and we'll save you a seat. And then finally, um, uh, next business after hours will be at Launch New Hampshire and that is on five, at 5.30 p.m. That is at the Harkness Co-Work Space, with, uh, just above the Concord Hotel, uh, 5.30 p.m. on February the 7th. Just want to mention a few folks that are joining us today. Uh, we have State Representative Lori Carey with us this morning. Also, uh, Mayor Jim Boulay and City Councilor Byron Champlin. So it's always great to see our elected officials. Thank you for joining us. And a big thank you to Ledyard uh, National Bank. Ledyard is a, a great supporter of the Chamber and lots of community uh, efforts and events locally. And without uh, the support of organizations like Ledyard, we couldn't put on programs like this. It just would not be financially feasible. So we're very grateful for their support and wanted to invite Kathy LeClaire, who is uh, Senior Vice President and Private Banking Director, to just come up and uh, say hello and welcome. So Kathy, thank, thank you. you. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you. We at Ledyard are very thrilled to be sponsoring again this very, very important event. Just a quick little update on Ledyard. We have expanded in the Concord market and actually in the past during 2022 have actually tripled our staff, including me. Um, my role, I am the new director, as you stated, of private banking. So my role is to tank the private banking division and to escalate it and to expand our product set and to actually grow and um, expand the role of the private banker that Ledger has. It, <clears throat> excuse me, just getting over a cold. We at the financial advisors and Ledger financial advisors, we are truly focusing on helping clients to visualize their futures by scenario planning and stress testing different outcomes to provide peace of mind and confidence. We have a great live well planning tool, um, financial planning tool that has been extremely successful. And I, you know, invite you all to reach out to one of us and we'll be glad to help you with it. It's now my pleasure to introduce to you Ari Pollock. Ari is a shareholder and director at Gallagher, Callahan, and Gartrell, PC. Ari represents business construction, land use development, and environmental clients on a variety of land use permitting, de permitting developing, environmental, and litigation matters. Okay, that was a mouthful. <laughs> He is the chair-elect on the Greater Chamber of Commerce Board of Directors and is also a member of State Government Affairs Committee at the Chamber. Welcome. You're welcome. Kathy, thank you so much. I, I write it, it is a mouthful, I write it that way in the hopes that someday my mother will be watching and she'll be, <laughs> she'll be able to say I finally became something. Um, we, we, have a, uh, we have really a very talented uh, panel for you today. This is uh, an annual event, but it's always exciting. Uh, it's particularly exciting to have the event occur at the first uh, year of the new legislative session uh, where uh, things are, are resetting themselves. Um, let me introduce our panel. They'll come up as I introduce them. They're each going to provide a few remarks. Uh, I'll start us off on a question and answer period, but then it's really up to the audience uh, to, to fire away. <clears throat> First is uh, Anne-Marie Timmons. Uh, Anne-Marie is a senior reporter at the New Hampshire Bulletin, a New Hampshire native who has covered state government, courts, and social justice issues for the Concord Monitor for over 25 years. 
And during her time with the Monitor, she won a Neiman Fellowship to study journalism and mental health policy at Harvard and has taught journalism at UNH uh, and uh, writing at the Naki Loeb School of Communications. Anne Marie launched the New Hampshire Bulletin, uh, a news uh, nonprofit outlet in March of 2021. And this four person newsroom covers the New Hampshire legislature, state agencies, and policy with a special focus on health, education, climate, energy, and business. Our second panelist is Phil Sletton. Phil is the research director at the New Hampshire Fiscal Policy Institute, where he's worked six plus years. He conducts research and analysis on state budget revenue, uh, expenditure, uh, and uh, economic security issues for Granite Staters, with a focus on low and moderate income uh, residents. He previously served three years as a performance auditor for the New Hampshire Office of Legislative Budget Assistant. He's born and raised in New Hampshire and earned uh, his bachelor's degree from the Grinnell College in Iowa and holds a master's uh, from the University of Wisconsin. Phil was also a graduate of the Leadership New Hampshire class for, uh, for 2018 and was recognized by the New Hampshire Union leader in their 40 Under 40 program in 2021. Heidi Kroll is our third panelist. Uh, Heidi is my partner at Gallagher, Callahan and Gartrell and works on public policy issues and legislative and regulatory matters relating to energy, the environment, healthcare, business strategies, uh, and economic and market trends. She's a government and regulatory affairs expert with more than 20 years of experience, and she represents renewable energy producers, health insurance carriers, home and community-based management companies, uh, and uh, is a trusted and respected source of expert information and appears regularly at the New Hampshire legislature in front of state agencies, uh, boards for public hearings, and offers testimony and presentations. And she works collaboratively with clients to achieve strategic initiatives. Our last and, and uh, but definitely not least uh, panelist is Dean Spiliotis, a, a, a civ civic scholar at SNU, the, in their School of Arts and Sciences. Don't be shy, Dean. Oh, okay. <laughs> His work focuses on presidential politics and policy, campaigns and elections, and New Hampshire politics and its presidential primary. Dean's the author of a book, Vicious Cycle, Presidential Decision-Making in the American Political Economy, and has published a variety of professional political science journals. Uh, he provides frequent political analysis for local and national media outlets and is a regular contributor on the New Hampshire Today show on WGIR radio. Dean earned his PhD in political science from the University of Chicago, and I'm sure you can all predict what question I'm going to ask Dean. Um, anyway, I thought uh, we would start with some brief remarks from each of our panelists, and Anne Marie, I'm told you're going first. How's that? Okay. Um, thank you for having me. This is um, really fun. I'm, I'm just going to say from the start, I'm going to be on my phone when Phil is talking because I'm recording him because he's such a great source. He said it was okay. Um, so I'm really looking forward to his budget remarks. Um, so we are the New Hampshire Bulletin. There's three reporters. There's 400 lawmakers. Um, so it's a challenge, um, certainly. I think this year is going to be even harder because it's so evenly divided in the House. There will be, every day will be an attendance game, who's there. Things, big things fail by one or two votes. So attendance is going to be really important and really hard to monitor and I think we'll see the calendar shift depending on who's in the audience you know things might get tabled and brought back so it's just going to be really hard harder than usual I think to keep track of things um, some things I will be watching and my colleague will be watching are the non-budget things even though we're in a budget year and if you think back to the last budget you probably can guess why you know, will the budget have every big controversial thing in it again? You know, abortion is back. There's legislation to expand access or to tighten the current law. There is environmental bills. You know, COVID lingers a bit. There's, um, there'll be legislation in trying to res restrict, I would say, some access to uh, the COVID vaccine and all vaccines. Um, there is legislation to roll back DHHS, uh, DHHS's uh, authority and rulemaking to decide what vaccines are added, if any. So those will be some big ones. 
Okay, I, the, a lot of the text isn't out yet on bills, but if you look up education freedom account, a lot of bills come up on that. So that will be something uh, we're watching. I think OLS, uh, which writes the bills, they had a staff shortage and then an illness come through and wipe them out. So we're still waiting on a lot of uh, legislation that we would normally have at this time. So I feel a little disadvantaged um, by that. I'm just gonna look at my notes. Um, I know we'll, uh, Phil will get into this more, but I was at a budget presentation yesterday from um, the Revenue Administration to Ways and Means, and we are not going to still have all the money that's coming in. You know, restaurants and hotels did well, real estate did well, but there's a prediction that that's going to slow. Tobacco sales <coughs> are down, so we'll see less money for sure this year. And the other question is, we did a lot of one-time investments this year. You know, Hampstead Hospital to expand mental health services was paid for with federal pandemic money. A veterans campus in Franklin was the same. So those will be interesting things to watch. Is there an appetite to continue that kind of investment um, when the federal money runs out, which is not too far from now? So that's going to be another sort of question about the budget. And so I'll just close by saying, I think we could get nowhere this year, or we could come together and get a lot done. I don't mean to be pessimistic, but I think it'll be a little um, tough to get things through this year. And then just what does the budget end up with? I've been asking lawmakers, do you expect you know, a Christmas tree bill again with everything in it? And they say, no, but it worked really well last year when they could not get anywhere on things. So. <laughs> Why would they change that if it gets tight again? So my prediction is we'll see more than the budget and the budget bill. <laughs> so, thank you, Anne-Marie. Uh, first, my earnest thanks to the Greater Concord Chamber of Commerce for putting on this event. Uh, it's always one I look forward to every year, whether I'm up here or, or with you in the audience. Um, and thanks to my fellow panelists, it's an honor to sit up here with you, and uh, to Ari for having to moderate my ramblings once again this year. So I will, I will do what I can to stay, uh, stay concise. <clears throat> um, before I get to my opening content, I want to note that the New Hampshire Fiscal Policy Institute is a nonprofit independent policy research organization based in Concord. We examine the state budget and state revenue policy, as well as the state economy. And those two topic areas are definitely going to be interacting with each other even a little bit more than usual, perhaps, uh, this year. And, um, and I want to note, too, that unlike the majority of states, uh, New Hampshire is a, has a two-year budget or a biennial budget. The majority of states actually have an annual budget process. Um, and 2023 is an odd-numbered year. And in odd-numbered years, the state legislature has to pass an annual budget. Uh, for to fund the government over the next two years, um, which in this case, that two-year period begins July 1st of 2023. So that's the deadline when you're thinking about when the legislature has to have some sort of spending authority in place. So projecting two years ahead is difficult in any circumstance, both on the tax revenue sides and on the service needs sides, um, in terms of the services that are funded by the state budget. Um, think about you know, when we're thinking about forecasting that this year, think about how much has changed in the last three years in the economy. January 2020, right? A lot has happened in the economy since since then. So the next two years are going to be um, potentially quite difficult to forecast. Both, again, what do those changes mean for tax revenue and what do they mean for services? Now, <coughs> pardon me, I am not here to give you my economic forecast. Um, this group heard from Director Brian Gottlob of New Hampshire Employment Security last month and his thoughts of the future of the economy are more uh, comprehensive than mine, but I am also in the camp that emphatically does not believe a recession is an inevitability. Uh, I think that there is uh, far more positive economic data out there than is often part of the discussion. That's How critical. you can stay. Okay, I'm glad, I'm glad to hear it. Um, however, uh, there is still certainly a higher risk of a recession than there usually is. It is certainly not something that is not going to happen. Um, I just don't think it is definitely going to happen, and that's what some of the, some of the dialogue is about. Um, it would also not be prudent, however, to plan a state budget on an overly optimistic scenario. So uh, if there is a recession coming, or at least an economic slowdown, what does the state budget need to do? And legislators will be in charge of determining that this session. 
Luckily, we enter this budget cycle with a pretty significant revenue surplus, or we're likely to anyway. Um, uh, there's now there's a lot of uh, large, a uh, fair number of large figures that have been thrown around regarding the size of the surplus. A lot of surplus dollars have actually already been obligated for purposes during the last legislative session. So there are some numbers that aren't the actual totals anymore because some of the money has already been <laughs> dedicated to other things. But if you look at the current cash surplus and last year's finalized surplus and take out the parts that have already been spent and the portion designated specifically for education, then the surplus is about $183 million. And there's another $99 million in the education trust fund in the surplus. <coughs> there's also about $90 million left in flexible federal funds. Anne Marie referred to some of those one-time investments made with those flexible federal funds. There are still um, some of those dollars that are not appropriated. And the rainy day fund is at about $160 million. So that's all quite good. Indeed, in any other year, that would be a really good set of numbers to have. Um, and it's still a good set of numbers to have in this year. Uh, and revenues have continued to grow. But also remember that costs have also continued to grow. Uh, the state government has to consider supply chain shortages, uh, energy costs, uh, the cost of uh, hiring and retaining employees, right? These are things that uh, all are affecting state budgets, uh, the state budget as well. Um, and there's the revenue side of the equation. How well will existing revenue sources do in this economy? And that's a tough question. Our largest tax revenue source is the business profits tax, which depends substantially on how well profits of, the, of large entities and multinational companies are doing. And those could be particularly volatile in a recessionary environment or an environment of economic slowdown. Tax revenues from restaurant meals, hotel rooms, and rental cars have done remarkably well over the last year or so. Um, but does that hold up if we have a widespread recession and people have less discretionary spending power? Real estate transfer taxes have also soared with home prices, but higher interest rates have already likely dampened prices and demand a little bit there, although the state continues to face a really severe housing shortage. And I have trouble seeing demand dry up entirely on the real estate transfer tax front because of that. The interest and dividends tax is beginning to be phased out this year uh, and will be uh, a reduction in state revenue every year under current law for the next several years because that tax is slated to disappear. So that will reduce state revenues as well relative to what they would have been. Um, but what about service needs during the recession? People will need more help if their incomes are curtailed or stop with loss of the jobs or, uh, or loss of their job or loss of hours at work. What about stimulating the economy with budget policies? Luckily, the evidence that we have, including fresh evidence from the federal government's pandemic era policies, suggests that many of these goals can actually be accomplished uh, by the same policy initiatives. So, uh, for example, food assistance, particularly through the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP, um, it's really economically stimulative. <coughs> Pardon me. Hmm. Sorry to cough in the microphone for you. Um, for every dollar invested, research, uh, research from several different organizations suggests that more than a dollar of economic output is generated for every dollar invested in food assistance, which makes sense. People use the dollar relatively quickly in their local economy. And uh, there's a particularly large impact in rural areas. So for every dollar invested, maybe about $1.50 in economic growth um, and more in rural areas. Unemployment compensation, which is essentially sending resources to people who've lost their income, um, that's also economically stimulative, as well as infrastructure projects. Medicaid enrollment will also <coughs> likely be higher, although current federal requirements around Medicaid enrollment complicate that picture. Um, both traditional Medicaid and Medicaid expansion help people who lose employment, both their incomes and their health coverage, um, you know, could, can affect their employment and their, in, uh, their coverage and their income, um, and bring federal dollars to New Hampshire to support the state's health care system and the state's economy. All of these policies do require that the state budget has resources, has revenue to be able to fund these policies. And, um, and state policymakers have already done quite a bit over the last six years that actually would reduce revenue to rel relative to what it would have been when it comes to the state budget's resources. So I'll be watching how state policymakers consider how to craft a budget that addresses service needs and raises enough revenue to fund those service needs and stimulate the economy as the economy might slow down. Uh, and finally, uh, what is the budget going to do, both in the short term and the long term, about the workforce shortage and about its interaction with the housing shortage, childcare affordability and availability, and education funding? 
Those are longstanding topics in New Hampshire, and the state budget will be another opportunity to help address them again, both potentially in the short and the longer terms. So I'll, I'll stop there, and my throat is going to make me stop there anyway. I should grab a sip of water, but I look forward to the questions and to the rest of the remarks of my fellow panelists. So thank you for your time. Good afternoon, um, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Um, my name is Heidi Kroll. I work at Gallagher, Callahan, and Gartrell, and I want to thank the Concord Chamber very much for um, inviting me to speak. It's a real honor. Um, to be up here with uh, my fellow panelists. Um, just to lay a little bit of the groundwork, uh, this, as, as Anne-Marie mentioned, um, our legislature has 424 members. There are 14 um, Republicans and 10 Democrats in the Senate. Um, and on the House side, there are 201 Republicans, 197 Democrats. There is already one um, vacant uh, House seat um, due to a representative in Nashua who uh, resigned due so, to some personal issues. Um, and there's also a, a race. There will be a special election in the town of Rochester, city of Rochester. Um, after a recount there, uh, the, it came out as a tie. So they will have a special election in February to, to determine that. So um, very close um, numbers in the House. Um, We'll get to this, I think, a little bit later, but uh, House committees um, have an equal number of Democrats and Republicans, with the exception of the House Finance Committee and um, the House Rules Committee, which each have a, a, one additional um, Republican on them. And as we typically see um, every year, uh, this year is no exception, we're seeing over a 1,000 um, bill requests that have come in from House members and senators, um, so there's quite a bit of... Um, ideas that people have for for uh, legislation this year. Um, as Ari mentioned, I focus um, uh, particularly on energy bills and health care related issues with a smattering of a whole bunch of other different things. So I just was going to quickly hit some um, highlights on things that I'm watching um, that I think, uh, you know, the business community might be interested in as well. So obviously on the energy side, people are very focused on High electricity costs, high gas costs, high oil prices across the board, very high pricing. Um, and so at the local level, um, legislators are trying to figure out what they can even do. Um, there's obviously a limited um, uh, options to them in terms of policies. Uh, but in ter one bill that may get some bipartisan support, we'll, we'll see. Um, New Hampshire has what's called a site evaluation committee. This is the kind of a, meant to be a one-stop shopping where um, large infrastructure projects, um, whether it's pipeline, transmission line, a power plant, or even utility scale um, wind or solar, uh, would go to this committee to try to get approval for a project. Um, there's a piece of legislation in this session that is meant to um, try to overhaul that. I think the sense is that maybe that is uh, becoming a barrier instead of a, a help to the process. Um, and so there's a piece of legislation that would overhaul that uh, pretty substantially in terms of uh, funding, jurisdiction, membership, staffing, um, uh, streamlining the process, um, enforcement after the fact when something's been built. So we'll see where that goes. But in terms of trying to be the optimist of where there might be some bipartisan support, that's a potential one there. Um, Net metering has been in the press for many, many years. I know that the business community um, so far has um, uh, laws do not allow uh, businesses to net meter with any facility that's above one megawatt. There is a piece of it to go up to five megawatts. There is a piece of legislation in this session to try to change that. I'm not sure that that really goes anywhere, but but it is there. There are a few other um, net metering uh, pieces of legislation that kind of nibble around the edges to try to help um, maybe increase some supply for group net metering, um, which businesses um, do participate in. Um, there's uh, also, people may remember a few years ago, uh, there was a piece of legislation that passed that did expand net metering um, for what was termed political subdivisions, municipalities, counties, uh, the state, uh, schools, uh, et cetera. And so there is a piece of legislation that's um, looking to potentially expand that a little bit by um, adding nonprofits. Again, I don't know if that will go anywhere. I don't know if it will ultimately be maybe perhaps a subset of nonprofits, you know, housing authorities or something like that. But uh, we'll see where that goes. Um, in terms of bills focused on the renewable portfolio standard, which is a, 
um, laws that New Hampshire has on the books to try to diversify our um, supply of where electricity is coming from. Um, there are a number of bills. Most of them appear to be focused on trying to um, either phase out the RPS program or dramatically overhaul it. I'm not sure that those are going to get anywhere. I think the renewable advocates are not necessarily going to be supportive of those particular pieces of legislation. Um, in terms of environmental bills, where there could potentially be some bipartisan support, one is um, area of PFAS. So this has garnered in historically um, bipartisan support because there are issues over on the seacoast as well as in the Merrimack area. Um, so you get a diverse um, kind of cross-section of um, legislators there. Um, there's a couple of pieces of legislation. Uh, some have bipartisan support, some don't. But we'll see. Um, as an example, one is banning PFAS in food packaging. I don't know if that will go anywhere or not, but we'll see. It does have bipartisan uh, co uh, sponsors and co-sponsors. Um, turning very quickly to health care bills, um, as Anne-Marie mentioned, there are a few kind of uh, bills that are focused on um, vaccines and COVID, uh, certainly far fewer than we saw last session. I think last session there were 30 or 35 bills, so um, far fewer this year, but nonetheless, there are a few there. Um, the reauthoriz reauthorization of Medicaid expansion, I do think that that will um, move forward in some form. Um, it's been, it's garnered bipartisan support in the past. Um, I think one of the questions is whether it gets a permanent reauthorization or whether it gets kind of another term limit, um, as we've seen in the past. You know, maybe it gets a, a five-year reauthorization or something. Um, but I do think that will ultimately get through. Um, there's some legislation around expanding Medicaid to include certain um, postpartum health care services. Uh, We'll see where that goes. As Anne-Marie mentioned, a variety of um, abortion and reproductive rights bills, um, as you might imagine. I'm not sure that those will get through. Um, they're very partisan. So uh, not a lot of looking through the sponsors and co-sponsors, not a lot of bipartisanship there. Um, funding for, for mental health and um, substance use disorder initiatives, which I know is important to the business community in terms of um, retaining and growing your staff. Um, healthcare workforce shortages. Uh, I think there will be funding and initiatives there. Um, obviously, a, a sector. Uh, every I think everybody's uh, experiencing the workforce um, challenges, um, and then a variety of um, health insurance coverage mandates. We see these every year. Um, I think, uh, for an example, you know, extending the duration of um, physical therapy or um, it, trying to require coverage for alternative. Um, uh, pain management, such as you know, covering yoga or something like that. Typically, the um, the New Hampshire Business and Industry Association has taken a position of um, opposing mandates simply because they do put upward pressure on um, health insurance premiums and copays. And I think the the sense, at least, of the BIA is that um, there are enough options out there that if either businesses or individuals are looking for a partic particular type of coverage, particular area um, that they, that would be out there, but otherwise, if they don't want to pay for that, they would have that option as well. So um, with that, I will stop and turn it over. Thank you. Good afternoon, folks. Let me just make a quick note of my uh, time here so I know when to stop. Um, it's always a pleasure to be here. I enjoy this. This is one of the events I look forward to. Um, uh, every year. Um, in, in interest of leaving enough time for q and I'll be fairly brief, uh, just some initial opening remarks. Um, the, the two questions I get asked most frequently uh, are currently are, uh, is uh, Governor Sununu going to run for president? Uh, and what about the New Hampshire primary? So uh, I'm going to forego the Sununu discussion for now, and we'll, we'll come back to that in Q&A. And I'll say a few <laughs> words about the New Hampshire primary and all the rigmarole going on with the, the Democratic National Committee. And then just a few, a, a few um, comments about the state legislature. I'm a political person, so I tend to think about this more in terms of politics and less in terms of policy. We have great uh, policy folks here uh, as well to answer, answer those types of questions. Uh, as you probably know, uh, the, uh, the uh, GOP has decided to leave the current, the, the primary schedule uh, the way it always is. So Iowa, New Hampshire, uh, Nevada, South Carolina, standard. The Democratic National Committee has proposed uh, uh, changing the schedule uh, in part in response to a request by the Biden administration. Uh, the argument is, as we've all heard this many, many times, and New Hampshire is 
uh, uh, not diverse enough. It doesn't really represent the diversity of the Democratic coalition. Uh, when I moved here, we were about 96% white. Uh, 30 years later, I think we're down to about 89% uh, white. So it's still difficult to make the case that we are kind of uh, ethnically and race racially diverse. Um, that's never <coughs> been the strongest case for the New Hampshire primary. The case has always been that we're a small state. <coughs> we're one of the most highly educated states in the country. Uh, we take our civic responsibility seriously. We're always among the top two or three states in terms of turnout. Uh, and that for all these reasons, we give, and but we're small, we're easy to get around, we're close to transportation hubs in Boston, New York, and D.C., uh, and it's an opportunity for candidates to build their candidacies block by block, rather than having to come into the game uh, with a lot of money up front. That's always been our best argument, the civic tradition, the uh, uh, fostering uh, candidates that maybe might not otherwise have a chance, et cetera. Uh, the DNC has been trying on and off for, for as long as I can remember, even going back into the 80s, uh, uh, into the 1980s, uh, to try to change this. The, the, the modern way that we select presidents really goes back to a set of reforms in 1972 uh, that came in the wake of the, uh, the riots in Chicago at the Democratic National Commission. So this process of primaries and caucuses, and there are fewer and fewer caucuses uh, every four years, I think they're eventually going to be obsolete. Uh, but this primary process that we have has been in place for about a little over 50 years now uh, in one form or another. Um, the DNC has been trying, at least in my, my recollection, since the 1980s to kind of change things uh, a little bit. Um, it happens periodically. Uh, in the past, we've been able to dodge the bullet, so to speak. Uh, you know, Bill Gardner, uh, for whatever disagreements what I've had with him over the years, uh, was a very staunch and effective defender uh, of the New Hampshire uh, primary. Um, and uh, now it's going to be Secretary of State Scanlon's turn to, to, to deal with uh, the challenges. Um, uh, the issue f the, and the, the proposed schedule, just real quick in case you haven't, haven't heard it, is uh, so now that the f first Saturday or so in February, uh, uh, South Carolina will go first. The South Carolina really is the place that revived Joe Biden's <laughs> presidential aspirations. South Carolina, then just three days later on a Tuesday, you'd have Nevada and New Hampshire going on the same day, uh, followed a week or so later by Georgia, uh, and then finally Michigan. All of this in the pre-window before the uh, Super Tuesday in the beginning of March. That's the proposal. Uh, the argument of the DNC is that that puts kind of the diversity of the Democratic Party uh, 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 front and center. Uh, their argument is, you know, New Hampshire still gets to be second with Nevada. It's only a few days later. Uh, some people argue that having those three primaries in such close proximity will actually favor wealthier candidates. Um, but the issue is, well, what does New Hampshire do? Uh, the DNC, uh, clearly knowing what they were doing, put in place a series of requirements. Uh, uh, in order to uh, extend our waiver, you have to have a waiver to go before the main <coughs> primaries start up. So we've always had a waiver. It's not something you really hear much about. But in order to keep our waiver and even allow, be allowed to go second, um, we would need to repeal the state law that says we go a week before any similar uh, contest. Uh, and we would need to um, uh, um, uh, put in place either uh, early voting, which we don't have. We have same-day registration, but not early voting. Um, and or some kind of no excuses absentee, similar to what we had during the, uh, the peak of the COVID uh, crisis. Um, they had to know that neither of the things were going to happen with a Republican legislature and a Republican governor. There's just no chance. It's a state law. Uh, Georgia is having similar issues because their Secretary of State, Brad Raffensperger, who we all know from all the stuff with former President Trump, uh, is a Republican. Uh, it's a Republican state. Um, the issue here is in some states, parties have more of a say. In other states, it's state law. So changing Democrats, the Democratic Party telling New Hampshire Republicans that they have to change a state law, it's just not realistic. Uh, but they did give us an extension. The DNC meets at the beginning of February. They've given us an extension. They've given Georgia an extension. Uh, the other three states are in better shape. Michigan, Democrats just took over the state legislature. Nevada's got its ducks in a row. Uh, and South Carolina, uh, the party has the ability to, to set that. So the question is, what's going to happen? It, I don't know. That's the reality of the situation. Um, I'm sure everything I've heard from everybody in both parties is that we're going to move ahead with our first in the nation. We go a week before. We'll schedule it at some point. Scanlon will schedule it a week ahead of a week or more ahead of uh, South Carolina. Should the new schedule go into place, um, there are some problems with that. 
traditionally, the sanctioning of delegates, basically what the parties would say in the past was, okay, if you move your date, whatever state, if you move yours up out of our window, um, uh, we're not going to seat your delegates. And that's not very effective. Typically what happens is towards the end of the process, the winning nominee says, oh, no, 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 you guys can come. We'll seat you. That's what Barack Obama did in, in 2008. But what the DNC is doing this time that is, uh, is a bit smarter is they are going to target the candidates themselves. Okay, candidate, if you go to New Hampshire and you're on the New Hampshire ballot, or if somebody else puts you on the ballot in your name, we're not going to let you be in any of the debates. And we're going to find other ways to punish you as a candidate. That's a little bit of a different strategy, and it may, be, it may be a more effective strategy. We just don't know. It may mean we may literally face a primary in which we have to write in candidates because they can't be on the ballot because they'll face sanctions from the uh, DNC. So um, I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, it's kind of interesting after I've been doing this for 30 years, and it's it kind of weird to feel like I don't know what's going to happen, but I honestly don't. Um, and so we're, we're going to continue to monitor that. Real quick, uh, let me say a couple words on the legislature. Um, as I talked to a state senator, who shall remain nameless, a few weeks ago, and he told me two things. He said the first thing is uh, the House of the State House of Representatives is going to come down to attendance. Right? There's no proxy voting uh, like there is in the U.S. Congress. You can't you can't have somebody else vote for you if you can't be there. Uh, I think I think uh, uh, Democrats tried to get proxy voting recently, and Republicans shot it down uh, in the House. Uh, so who shows up is going to determine, in many respects, what passes. And, and he told me it's not un unusual for 30 to 40 people to be absent uh, on a given day. That can have a huge impact uh, on, uh, on how votes turn out. The other thing is in the state Senate, the question is, it, are the districts so gerrymandered that we're basically going to always have this, you know, 14, 10, 13, a uh, 14, 10, 15, 9 split? Uh, I'm not sure. This is an ongoing debate among political scientists, you know, how just how gerrymandered are those districts. Um, and so that's something to be, wa be watching. Um, so with such a closely divided house, with attendance being such a big issue, there's going to be an element of volatility. Uh, and small groups of people, as we saw, just saw in the U.S. Congress, will be able to have outsized impacts. Um, finally, in terms of the kinds of policies I'm going to be watching, uh, uh, we've heard this talk about parental rights, which is kind of a broad umbrella for a variety of social and cultural issues affecting parents and their children. Uh, that may be something that Governor Sununu has to figure out how he's going to deal with coming from his own party. Uh, education funding, Medicaid reauthorization is something I hear all the time. Uh, and then in particular, housing costs and energy costs are the two, two biggies uh, that I think are going to be on the table. Um, so I'm going to stop here because I want to make sure we have you know, 15 minutes for questions, but uh, I'm happy to ex uh, follow up on any of this uh, if you'd like. Thanks. Thank you very much. Great. So thank all of our panelists. That really set the stage for what I hope will be a pretty robust question and answer session. I'll, I'll get us started off. We, we had um, over 1,000 legislative service requests this year. That is not an atypical number of, of new, fresh, and recycled old ideas uh, that uh, someone at the State House feels we can't live without. Um, and uh, many of those actually were filed before the election and before the balance of power was determined. Uh, and so uh, th those LSRs may very well reflect uh, typical topics and business as usual, but I think all of the panelists referred to this may not be the session or the climate for business as usual. And sure enough, uh, Speaker uh, Packer has already signaled the need for bipartisanship by structuring at least most of the uh, policy committees with bipartisan uh, numbers, eight and eight, uh, 10 and 10, um, not <coughs> balanced for the majority party uh, or out of balance for the majority party. So my question is, does that lead to stagnation does it lead to a less effective committee structure where bills are reported without a recommendation? Or, who knows, does it lead to a more bipartisan element where you're not picking off a party's position, but you're picking off individual <coughs> members' positions because the margins are so razor thin? Um, I, I guess, why don't we just go in order, and we'll start with Anne-Marie, and we'll work our way toward me. Um, not to put anybody on the spot, but... I think we want to hear from each of you on this one. You're right. The numbers are very bipartisan. I'm not sure the outcomes will be that way. 
it'll depend on who goes to committee and, and say there is a tie vote and it goes to the full house as a tie vote. There again, it's attendance and the average attendance for a lawmaker is about 80% before the election and so this has changed a bit. There was a surprisingly num high number of reps who are working age so they have jobs and they miss because of that. Um, COVID is still a real thing uh, for a lot of these big public gathering spaces. We saw that Democrats stayed home during COVID over safety concerns, Republicans did not, and that determined a lot the last time. So that could continue. So I think the numbers look bipartisan. I think these early conversations are very bipartisan <coughs> sounding, um, but I, I'm not sure it's really gonna end up looking like that. And as I've talked to people about the budget who've watched this for a while, they started predicting, you know, continuing resolutions that we won't get anywhere, and that we'll have to make these little, you know, small steps. Um, and lastly, I guess I would say I think the idea of a small group having outsized influence is a real thing, more so on the Republican side. You know, do you have the Liberty Caucus, and they were re really able to get a lot of their priorities through the budget last time by withholding their votes if you don't add these things. It was truly an ultimatum that they put forward. If you do not do these things, we will not vote for the budget. And you, that, had, that had impact, that they were successful. And so between attendance and that group, and it's hard to tell how many people are in that group, um, some identify that way and some do not. So it's really hard to know um, what we're gonna see, but I, I guess I don't think it's going to be as bipartisan as it looks on paper. I'll say one committee that is not perfectly balanced is the Finance Committee, um, which writes the state budget or the draft of the state budget that comes out of the committee anyway. It can be amended on the floor. Um, and among the pieces of legislation that are in the have to pass category or something has to pass, the state budget is at the, sort of the top of that list, right? Um, there's uh, no better definition of dysfunction when the government cannot function because it's not funded, right? Um, uh, so the, uh, and again, I think that when you get to the floor uh, where you have such a close margin as Heidi identified, um, then what happens? Uh, the, in 2017, the House did not pass a budget. So that's something that can happen. In that case, the Senate took two House bills that had already passed and amended the budget to it uh, and then moved forward with that process. Um, bipartisan budgets also do happen, right, in terms of a budget that, is, that it receives a broad swath of the vote in both chambers. Uh, that is something that has happened in the past, in the last decade. Um, it hasn't happened in the last half decade or so. Um, so that, would, uh, that, is, that is another possibility. But because uh, of the... Uh, most recent past experience that Anne-Marie referred to around the, um, I think you called them the big controversial items that were attached to the, to the last state budget in order to, uh, in order to ostensibly get enough votes on the House floor. Does that happen again this time when the margin is this close? I mean, there's a big difference between, for example, 212 and 201, and I don't, I don't know the answer to that. It depends on probably what those particular items are and what the, um, number of legislators who are most interested in these items is. So I will start out by being somewhat optimistic and end by being pessimistic. So I do think that the close numbers in the House do provide some opportunities on some limited sets of issues. Um, the House, for example, has set up two special uh, committees, um, one to deal with child care and the other to deal with housing. So these are standing committees that will, um, special standing committees that will deal with uh, legislation on those two issues. And I think it has the potential for some bipartisan support um, around some potential solutions, um, both on the child care and, and housing front. So, so there's some possible opportunities there. Um, and obviously that would be good for the business community if we could, um, if that could help with the workforce issues. Uh, possibly legalizing cannabis um, with some guardrails, perhaps. Um, the Senate is less um, excited about this issue, but in the House, um, cannabis bills have passed in the past, have passed in the past. Um, and this year, um, there's a piece of legislation that has um, is being sponsored by um, the majority leader, Jason Osborne, as well as the minority leader, um, Matt Wilhelm. So 
Um, that's, at least on the House, something that could potentially get through. <laughs> As I mentioned before, reauthorizing Medicaid expansion um, in some fashion, probably get some bipartisan support um, and, and potentially maybe um, some energy policies. But I do agree with the other comments that I think um, a lot of pieces of legislation are going to come out of committees in the House on a tie vote um, without a committee recommendation. Um, when a bill comes out of committee and goes to a House floor, um, to the House floor without a recommendation, um, the rules uh, say that the first motion is an ought to pass motion. Um, however, um, the motion to table a bill trumps any other motion. So um, I think the bottom line is that there will be, as others have said, a lot of activity on the House floor that we have not seen in the past um, versus having more of the work um, and activity happening in the committees. Um, agree completely that uh, member attendance is going to be a huge factor. Um, I agree that lots of people um, are are absent on any given uh, session day due to illness, travel, family obligations, um, as well as vacant seats over time. Um, seats do become vacant um, due to resignations, deaths, um, people moving uh, out of district. Um, so I think the bottom line is that many votes on the House floor are going to be very, very close, um, razor close, or, you know, razor thin margins. Um, and I agree also that um, small factions, potentially within either party, um, could have significant leverage. Yeah, just real quick, I, I, I'm, I'm pessimistic, uh, just given all we've seen in the past and given kind of the national mood uh, politically. Um, you know, although legalizing weed is something that always seems to bring everybody together, so that may be the one, the one exception, and then the chambers can just chill out afterwards. <laughs> um, uh, this, is, this, is, this kind of setup within closely divided parties is prime uh, prime time for the floor managers and the floor leaders to whip votes and whip attendance. It's going to be all about uh, lining up, lining up your your votes and making sure people are there to vote. But uh, you know, maybe maybe uh, I'll be surprised, and some of the legislative output will be more bipartisan. But I don't have any real reason to expect that uh, uh, going in. Thanks. This is the audience participation part of the show. Um, we'll take questions uh, from any of you. Put your hand up. I'll recognize you. Um, we'll, we can go a little bit beyond one o'clock. And there's a question in the back. Thank you. So, uh, the committees that, uh, that say eight, eight, ten, seven. Who assigns the members? Is it the party itself that has the ability to assign who's going to be on those committees? If I have um, the Democratic Party and I get eight, do I get to pick who I want, or is it somehow assigned in the, in the process? Great question. Heidi, yeah. that's a great one for you. Sure. Um, so there is a, is a bit of a mix. Um, so first of all, um, the House Speaker, Sherm Packer, did make a commitment that he would have even numbers um, on the majority of the committees, as we've talked about. Um, members, uh, when they come in, have an opt. They can select, like, their, I think you get to give your, your top three um, picks in terms of what committees you uh, are interested in being on. And that ultimately um, the leadership for either the Republicans or the Democrats makes a decision about how they're actually going to allocate people um, to the committees. I think in part, you know, looking at people's background, there's a real diverse um, background, as you might expect, of, of House members. Um, they come from, you know, all walks of life, a variety of careers, um, et cetera. So, you know, they look at that experience as well as experience in the legislature. So are you a first term uh, per, uh, representative or are you there for your, you know, your 10th term, <laughs> I'm maybe exaggerating, but you know, so what are your experiences? So um, it's, a, it's a mix, but ultimately it is the, um, the party leader's decision. Yeah. Okay, so I'm not so sure that this question really is for this panel. However, with homelessness increasing, not only in the state of New Hampshire, but across the country and due to the pandemic, what can the state do financially to assist the cities and towns to help alleviate the burdens and costs for the homelessness? So the question was the burden of homelessness on New Hampshire municipalities. What can the state have to do to help municipalities better prepare to address those issues? And Bill looks like he's stepping up to the microphone. Sure, yes. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, and, and you had asked financially around what, what the state could do to help cities and towns. Um, on the housing front generally, and this is, I know, not just homelessness, but housing writ, writ large, 
Um, a lot of the resources that the state has allocated most recently have been one-time federal funds. Um, that being said, there have been some ongoing general fund commitments as well that have been increased over the last few state budgets. Uh, there was recently a one-time com a commitment of one-time federal funds as well to um, focus specifically on services um, targeted at um, combating houselessness, um, homelessness, and um, uh, and also recognizing that as we head into, uh, or I should say, period, recognizing that we're heading into a, a potentially more economically um, uh, le less robust environment, uh, and housing costs are might you know stop growing as quickly, right? If that that would be a, that would be a, among the better outcomes as opposed to continuing to grow very quickly. Uh, there are definitely. <laughs> opportunities for the state to allocate funding to cities and towns, either more more funding generally or for this specifically. And that could be one-time federal funds, which the timeline for using those is out to the end, or of the most flexible ones, is out to the end of 2026. So that's still a fairly long time horizon. Uh, or allocating funds through the state budget. Those are absolutely, with, that's absolutely within the purview of things the state could do should it choose to do. And there are both those flexible federal resources and to the extent there's general funds available, state resources available to do that. Um, the program that was, and I'm trying to remember how much of it was new programming versus adding on to existing programming, um, and Anne-Marie may know this better than I do, but the programming that was funded with several million dollars in federal funds um, targeted at uh, combating homelessness, uh, that, you know, we have a fair number of these federal programs or federally funded programs now that have been stood up since the pandemic began. That is among the uh, among the options, as Anne Marie identified, among the options that the state policymakers have is do we continue to fund these with state funds? Or do we put more federal funds into this? So there's a couple opportunities there that are either home either directed at homelessness or homelessness adjacent, and there are resources available for it if policymakers decide to allocate them. I'll just add <clears throat> One thing, I think another question is, do we put more money into mental health treatment and to substance use um, disorder? Those go hand in hand, you know, with that population, also the criminal justice population. <coughs> and we've seen a little bit of, you bring this on yourself, so therefore the government will not bail you out. And then on the other side, this is a disease and we have obligation to help. So those, that's the two ends of that conversation. Um, and so I think that is key, too, to solving the homelessness problem or to mitigating it. And there's just so far, even if they put money into mental health, it's still not enough. So will there be more money put into that? Is there more money to put into that? So we're, we're rapidly down to the speed round. Um, you've each made reference to uh, legalization of recreational cannabis as an issue that could potentially receive some bipartisan attention, uh, in particular in the House, where there is a bipartisan bill su submitted, um, which will go to a uh, um, committee hearing. Um, historically, the New Hampshire House has passed cannabis legalization. The Senate has killed cannabis legalization. It's not reached the governor's desk where reports are mixed in terms of his reaction to receiving that bill. Um, yes or no, thumbs up, thumbs down. If it reaches the Senate, does it pass the Senate in this legislature? And where you get to go first? I thought we were just doing thumbs. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen one yet. <laughs> I think there's a yes, but if it, maybe it passes the Senate, does it clear the governor's desk? You know, we saw him come out with a press, press release, I think, yesterday. There's no safe drug. You know, marijuana is not safe, nothing is safe. So. You know, he's, t he's like with a lot of issues, he's, you know, good at being on the fence. Uh, and so last year he seemed open to signing some kind of legalization bill. I don't see how you say no safe drug and then also sign it. All right, Phil, thumbs up. So uh, I don't know enough to answer your question directly, Ari, but I'll say that I'll be watching the revenue implications, especially if, <laughs> especially if it, it, they are relied upon to balance the state budget. Uh, not count those dollars just yet. <laughs> uh, yes, I would probably, if I had to bet, I would say it would not pass the Senate. Um, 
I think you will see some bipartisan support there, um, you know, some Democrats who are opposed for the reasons that Anne Marie mentioned about the health implications, impl implications for mental health in the SUD. Um, on the other hand, we know that there are some House Republicans who are now um, uh, Republicans in the Senate who are potentially more inclined to be supportive, but I think at the end of the day, it would not pass, and certainly if the governor um, vetoed the legislation and it went, went back to the House and the Senate for a veto override, um, I don't think the votes are there to override. Not so fast, Steve. We have a different question. That was quite a Yeah, so we're, we're, we're rapidly uh, running out of yeah. time. The question for Dean is two parts. Will Governor Sanu announce the president? <laughs> and if the answer is yes, how will he do in the new Hampshire? Oh, uh, that's primary? a good, good question. Um, let me just say real quick on, on legalization, because it's something I hear about all the time. Not legal escape, um, legal, no, I got my answer right here. Um, uh, the issue, I mean, you think about it, we're basically surrounded now, right? Canada, Maine, Vermont, Massachusetts, pretty much the entire Northeast at this point. Um, the issue is, as I think maybe as Anne Marie mentioned, it, Governor Sununu has traditionally articulated this belief that marijuana is a gateway drug to other forms of, of substance uh, misuse. And so uh, until, that, until he changes that view, uh, I'm not sure how he justifies signing a bill. And then you, you would need the legislature, if he vetoes it, you would need the legislature to, to override it. So. Until I hear him articulating a different kind of view on, on marijuana itself, I'm not sure how we get past. That's a pretty that's a pretty hard hurdle to clear if someone believes that that's the case, and that's something people debate all the time all around the country. Um, on on Sunu, uh, you know, is he going to run? As he as he himself is now saying on cable news virtually every other day, uh, maybe uh, he's been on TV a lot. You've probably seen him. Uh, I think because he won pretty easily. Uh, in a time when other Republicans had a surprising struggle. He's bought himself some political capital uh, to kind of be out and about. He's sort of a new, someone, someone new on the stage in a way. I mean, we all know him very well, but the reality is nationally he's not that well known. Older voters may remember his father if they were politically active in the 80s, um, but he, he, this is good visibility for him to be on TV uh, several times a week. Um, the issue for him, and if you've listened to what he's saying, he's already, if, if he runs, I think it's going to be on an economic message. He really, I listened to him the other night, and he sounded like a kind of a free market capitalist, quasi-libertarian economically, you know, let, let business do its thing and, and keep government out of the way. The challenge for him is getting through a national Republican, getting through the primaries. Um, he's not a, for as much as Democrats lambast him, in the grand scheme of the Republican Party, he's not a culture warrior. And uh, uh, how is he going to do with evangelicals, which are a critical part of the base nationally for Republicans? He's pro-choice, we could argue, he says he's pro-choice, we could argue whether or not that's the case based on what he's actually done. But what's the likelihood the GOP is gonna I mean, nominate a pro-choice uh, presidential nominee? Even Donald Trump, who was a pro-choice Democrat for most of his adult life, became a strong uh, uh, anti-choice individual. Remember saying in one of the early town halls that women should be punished for having uh, abortions and then he backtracked from that. So the, the risk for Sununu is that he gets pigeonholed as kind of a moderate, like a Larry Hogan the former governor of Maryland, uh, he can't get through a primary like that. He might do well in a general election, um, but he can't get through uh, a, uh, a primary. And so that's the big challenge, is sort of what, like, how would he fit in? Um, and it's interesting, there are individuals like, uh, you mentioned my work with WGIR, we, inter we, we interview a lot of these candidates. We've already interviewed Mike Pence twice. So Pence basically calls in almost every week. So he's gonna run for president. Um, uh, someone like Asa Hutchinson, who we talk to all the time, he's going to run for president. He's the, the now former governor of Arkansas. Sarah Huckabee Sanders is the new is the new uh, governor. Uh, and I read that she just banned the use of the word Latinx in all state <laughs> documents. That's what I'm talking about when I talk about uh, a culture war. So uh, uh, Asa Hutchinson, who would have been like a real kind of southern conservative in the old days, I'm not sure he's conservative enough for the for the Republican primary electorate. So how Sununu does is really a function of where that electorate is uh, in a year or two. I mean, if we do this event next January, we'll have our answer. Um, you know, if he runs here, you know, that's the sort of the favorite son uh, example. Um, some people say, well, that'll make the primary less relevant. Um, it's certainly not slowing down any of the other candidates who are, who are calling in. Just, I just got it down a list of all the people we've talked to already. Uh, Pence, DeSantis, Pompeo, Hogan, Hutchinson, Christy Nome uh, from South Dakota, Chris Christie, uh, and the list goes on. So 
the GOP is proceeding as though, uh, though Trump is not the only, uh, only one in the race. And he's going to have an event in South Carolina, I heard, coming up uh, pretty soon. So he's going to start to get his, his campaign moving. So I don't know the answer. It'd be interesting if he did. It'd be a lot of fun. Um, he certainly seems to be enjoying his newfound uh, status in the party. Dean, thank you. We're going to hold you to that maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I'll let you know for sure next January. Well, I think there are three rules of engagement for a dinner party, right? It's good company, good conversation, good food, and I say we nailed all three. Um, I want to thank our panelists, uh, really a distinguished group. I want to thank all of you for coming, and I certainly want to thank Ledger Bank for sponsoring today's event. Uh, and on behalf of the Chamber, thanks everybody.